Um, all right, so without further ado, I'll, I'll introduce the guy, uh, at least on my screen, he's in the upper left corner, and that's Philippe Cohen, uh, live from, uh, from France, from Saint-Emilion, or just outside Saint-Emilion. Um, and uh, Philippe is, uh, has, has, we've been working with Philippe's wines now for, I don't know, what, five, maybe five years, four, five years, I think, something yeah. like that. Um, and, uh, and, and obviously we love the wines, uh, but, but he's also become uh, a great friend and, uh, and, and someone whom uh, I, I confide in a lot. And we talk a lot about business as well, out, you know, outside of just Butai Fair. Um, and, uh, and, and very proud to, to represent the wines and to call him a friend. So, uh, so everyone, this is Philippe Cohen. Um, and I, I think the best place to start before we get into to wines um, and start getting technical on wine and, and all of that stuff is I, I would love for you to share with everyone the, the what I call the origin story, if you will, of, um, of Chateau Vieux Taifair, because neither you nor your wife, Catherine, originally are from Bordeaux. Um, you didn't grow up. You're not, you know, one of these stories like we hear so often in France where you're, you know, the eighth generation in the family to take over the vineyards and make the wine. So it's, uh, it, it's, it's a unique story, I think, especially in a place like Saint-Emilion where uh, it's not easy to break into if you're an outsider, correct? <laughs> no, no, it's very difficult. Uh, Bordeaux was a complete novelty to me uh, uh, 25 years ago. Uh, the story is that um, I... Uh, when we started the, 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 the business, um, we, my wife uh, did uh, an ology in Dijon and um, she got her first uh, internship um, in Pomerol. So luckily she, she, she actually, as a, you know, being a woman uh, 25 years ago, looking at her job uh, in the business was very, very difficult, especially in Bordeaux. Uh, so she was, there were probably three women uh, in the whole course uh, in Enology in Dijon. And um, she uh, couldn't find uh, any uh, stage, internship in, um, in Burgundy. Uh, so she decided, okay, there's no way I can find a, a place where I can do the vinification. And uh, that was in 1995. And she said, okay, I'm going to try the, uh, probably to just send letters to the, the, the big names. Um, and she did send her uh, resume to uh, to Petrus and uh, Jean-Claude Berouet, who's the winemaker, uh, who was the winemaker at Petrus at the time, uh, said, okay, you join in for uh, the, the vinification of the 1990 vintage, 1995 vintage. Um, so, you know, the Moex family owns Petrus. They had like uh, 15 def different estates. They produced some beautiful wines. And she was uh, dedicated to the vinification at La Fleur Petrus. So at the time, uh, it was much better than today. You had one person at every chateau, from Petrus, Trotanois, La Fleur Petrus, uh, and all the different domains they own. And you had Jean-Claude Berouet, who would turn up once in the morning, give the instructions, and, uh, and that was it. So Catherine was at uh, La Fleur Petrus in 1995. We met in 1998, got married, uh, no, sorry, we, got mar we met in 1996, got married in 1997, and, um, and we were both looking for a job in 1998. I had no connection whatsoever with Bordeaux, uh, but my wife did her stage in, um, in 1995, so she uh, wrote a letter, she called actually Jean-Claude Berouet, and she said, I'm now looking for a job. So if you can find something for me in Bordeaux, I'd be happy to join. So he said, okay, we're gonna start the 1998 vintage vinification. You start next week. So we both moved to Bordeaux with uh, our uh, young one-year-old daughter. And, uh, and I had no job in Bordeaux because I had no connections and I didn't even know Bordeaux. I was born in Paris, lived in Paris most of my life. So no connections in Bordeaux. At the time, there was no recession, no crisis, no COVID, no whatever. Uh, still, I couldn't find a job. I speak fluently four different languages. I was ready to do whatever was possible to do in the business. But nobody would hire me just because I wasn't from Bordeaux. And I was a complete novelty to these people. Anyway, my wife was doing the boy making at uh, La Fleur Petrus again in 1998, which I believe is one of the best vintages ever uh, on the right bank. Um, absolutely beautiful. Not as good on the left bank, but beautiful uh, on the right bank. 
and she did the winemaking in 98. And then progressively, uh, she was working as the assistant of Jean-Claude Berwey. Uh, I still couldn't find a job, so I did nothing for about two, three years, except from uh, taking care of my daughter. And um, I finally found a job in Paris in the wine industry. Uh, so moved to Paris every day, uh, I mean, every week, uh, leaving uh, Monday morning and come back on a Friday. And we were both, of course, uh, hoping to find uh, a domain, a place where we could produce, produce wine. The problem is we have no connections, no money, and, uh, and we're not from Bordeaux. So very difficult to find a place to produce wine. Luckily, when uh, Jean-Claude Berruy retired, uh, he knew from uh, the very beginning that we were looking for a place to produce some wine. Uh, and he knew someone, so the ex-owner of Chateau Vieux Terre, who had no inheritance, uh, who was willing to sell his property. Uh, so the old man, 84 years old, said, um, I want to find someone, but I don't want to sell the property to any of my neighbors because they all know that I don't have any inheritance and they all want to buy the property. And they're chasing me all the time and they're waiting for me to die to buy the property. So Jean-Claude Berouet, who was a friend of this, the, the ex-owner of Chateau vieux said to the owner, ex-owner of Chateau vieux I'm going to introduce you to a young couple. And because uh, I know you don't want to sell to any of your neighbors. So maybe you'd be interested to sell to people you don't know, even know about. Uh, and I do recommend these people because I've been working with Catherine for a long time and she's a very good person and she makes more than decent wines, and I believe that uh, they, could, they could start a, a nice story at Chateau vieux This guy had no real connections in the business. He was selling his wine uh, on markets and maybe 80 or 85% bulk to the trade. Uh, so there was no big history about Chateau vieux except that the location is very nice. It's the, what you see on the background behind Todd. Uh, it's literally by the river. So the very south of the Appalachian, that's where the house is. But uh, all the parcels we have, it's five hectares altogether. All the parcels we have are everywhere in the Appalachian, in every actually village where you're allowed to produce Saint-Emilion. So that would be Vignonnet, Saint-Sulpice de Falerins, Saint-Emilion, Saint-Christophe-des-Bardes, Saint-Laurent-des-Combes, and, <laughs> and that's it, yeah. So, uh, so we have like five parcels now. So this guy, we've got introduced to this man. And we couldn't buy the property. It was way too expensive for us to buy. Uh, and we didn't have any money. Um, I was working in the trade. So the banks, at the time, you had no recession. So the bank, you could get at least a little bit of money from the banks, but not enough to buy the property. So the, the old man said, listen, I'm 84. I, have, I don't need money. Uh, I have no inheritance. Uh, so what we're going to do, we're going to do a deal. Uh, what you can get from the bank now, you'll buy a part of the property. And when you start making money producing the wine, the rest I'm going to rent to you. And when you start making money, you'll buy the rest of the property. So we started in 06, uh, first vintage at uh, Chateau vieux Taifer. And um, the most difficult part for us was to uh, make something completely different from what the ex-owner was producing. And and well, and uh, Philippe, originally, how many hectares was the purchase? It was it was uh, three point five. Oh, yeah, so very small. Very small, but largely enough for us, especially in terms of money. It was largely enough to uh, to cope with for a start. So uh, so we started with um, with three point five hectares, and uh, the first thing that was obvious to us is that um, we had potentially two different wines. Our approach is much closer to a Burgundy approach than a Bordelais approach for uh, very specific reasons. One, we only use Merlot or maybe 98% of Merlot. We have a little bit of Cabernet Franc, but we hardly ever use it. I think it's a wrong casting where we are. And the parcels we have, we've been trying every single vintage from the warmest to the coldest, and we never managed to get some decent Cabernet Franc, especially where we are. It doesn't work. In, our, in my opinion. Uh, so it's mainly Merlot, so it's a bit like Burgundy, it's, it's mono cépage. Uh, the second part is uh, it's terroir driven because we believe we have two wines, but not in the Bordelais approach. It doesn't mean we have a Grand Vin and then a second wine. I just hate the idea. 
it's, the, it's much more the idea that we have a village wine and we maybe have, uh, with a lot of humility, a premier cru. So we have a single vineyard, which is the Chateau Vieux Taillefer, and that we only produce 3,000 bottles. And that will be on the terroir argilo calcaire, uh, uh, what we call the calcaire asteri in Saint Christophe des Barbes. Very small parcel, but very old Merlot. And then the rest, what is called the Pavillon Taillefer, which is definitely not a second wine. It's 98% of the production. Uh, it's the classic cuvée, as you would say, in the Chateauneuf du Pape. It is the village wine, as you would say, in Burgundy. Uh, it's 95% um, Merlot, if, but most of the time it's 100% Merlot. Uh, we're actually not allowed to make 100% Merlot, but we do. We, it's not on the paper, but it's, it's 100% Merlot. Uh, and that is our expression of what uh, a Merlot is on the right bank in Bordeaux. So it's on the five different areas, five different terroirs, and we blend these five terroirs all together. They all come from Merlot, different location, different terroir, and that's our expression of what a Merlot is on the right bank. So it's a Merlot village. Uh, and then, which is the single vineyard. Um, and, then, and then there's actually a third wine, the, the white wine, which we'll, we will talk about. But I, I thought since you're talking about the areas where you have vines, maybe it'd be a good, good time to, to show everyone. I have a map. Um, I can, I'm going to share, share my screen here on that one. But um, um, if I can figure out how to do it, let's see. There we go. Um, there we go. Can everyone, is everyone seeing this, uh, this Google map? Yeah. Are you, can you okay? So maybe you can you can talk us through this a little bit, Philippe. Here we have you know Bordeaux, obviously, um, yeah. and then Saint Emilion. You can see over over here. I'll zoom in now a little yeah. bit and show everyone, and you can point out maybe some of the areas where you have vineyards, um, if that's helpful for people that like the uh, the visual as well. Okay, so we're we're based literally by the river. You can see the river, so we're next to the river. Uh, that's where we are exactly, Vignonet. Uh, so we have a parcel which is one hectare here. We have one in Saint-Sulpice de Falerance. We have one in Saint-Emilion, one in saint laurent des combes and at the very top, uh, the northern part of the appellation, saint christophe des barbes uh, So saint christophe des barbes for those who know, uh, that's where you have uh, probably what we call the best terroir in Saint-Emilion. Um, and the most uh, well-known chateau except from Saint-Emilion. Um, so all our parcels are located in very different areas with very different identities. Um, and we like the idea of having all these identities being blended together to make a Merlot from the right bank in Bordeaux. Uh, that's why we would rather call it uh, a village wine instead of a second vin or just a classic cuvée. Uh, village, uh, plural. It's the village from Saint-Emilion that are allowed to be produced in Saint-Emilion. Grand Cru doesn't mean anything to me because the classification in Bordeaux is just a nightmare, especially in the right bank. It changes all the time. Uh, so it doesn't mean, it may, it, it, today actually to get the certification for uh, Grand Cru is the only ability to age. Okay, big deal. Uh, it doesn't mean anything. So um, uh, if, if we were allowed to do what people are allowed to do in Burgundy, I'd rather call it saint Emilion Village, Catherine and Philippe Cohen. And for the other wine, uh, we would call it saint Emilion Premier Cru, Catherine and Philippe Cohen. And that would be it, easier, much easier. Then the Vieux Taillefer, which is only an, the name of a location. Taillefer is a name, only the name of a location in, um, in saint Emilion. So, so kind of looking at the map here, uh, I don't know if everyone can tell, but you have you have down below the, the village of Saint Emilion is up here, but down below, uh, all the way down to the Dordogne River, where your your house is just down here. Um, you have more of a more clay in the soil here, correct? Because it's more of a, a plain, like alluvial soil. In uh, in um, in, uh, but actually, the, the so the parcel we have in Vignonnet is literally by the rivers, next to the house, and that is one of the largest parcels. It's one point five hectares. Uh, it's very close to the house. It's next to the house. Like, uh, you have just a parcel. Yeah, the, exactly where you are here. Yep. Uh, the big parcel, uh, literally against, uh, close to the river. And then in Saint-Christophe-des-Bardes, we have oh, another parcel. Uh, 
but uh, 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 we get to sing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's much more stony. It's what we call the veine de grave that goes from the top of Saint Emilion down to the river. Saint Emilion down the to the river. Uh, Hundred thousands of years ago, uh, all the erosion came out in Saint Emilion on the top of the hill and came down to the river, bringing all the stony parts. Uh, so that is a parcel that, if you look at the ground. Uh, it looks like Chateauneuf du Pape. You have all these uh, big stones, um, and they bring all the minerality to the wine. So that's what we like. So you have the sandy part, which is Saint um, Vignonnet, which brings a lot of smoothness in the wine, and then you have Saint Sulpice de Falerins, which brings a lot of minerality to the wine. Then you have the parcel, which is in um, in Saint Emilion, uh, that is. Between uh, Vignonnet and Saint Sulpice de Falerins, uh, Saint Christophe de Bard brings a lot of, uh, I mean, I would say the, um, the, the, the large part of the wine. Uh, and, uh, and, the, the, and the last one brings a lot of uh, length in the wine. So it's, it's interesting to have uh, this combination because it really shows, because we're literally in all the villages, we have parcels in every single village where you can produce uh, Saint Emilion. So you have the, the expressions of what Saint Emilion is gathered into a bottle of wine of Merlot. Great. Good then the approach on the winemaking. So we're organic, not certified uh, for one specific reason. Uh, we've been using with my wife for the last uh, uh, six years uh, a product which is substitution to, uh, to sulfites. So it's not a vin naturel, as you say in French. Um, the actual bottle, if you have a bottle of, of, of um, if you have a glass of wine uh, and you've managed to taste the Vieux Taillefer or the Pavillon Taillefer, or even the Blanc, uh, there's no use of sulfites whatsoever. So we use a substitution, uh, which is a product that comes from uh, the grape seed uh, that are polyphenol. So the wine has protection. It's not like Vin Naturel that you can find from many producers in France or elsewhere. Uh, it is a wine that is totally product, uh, um, protected, but it's protected by a, an organic product um, that is made in Switzerland and uh, it's made from grape seeds and it's a substitute to sulfites. Uh, the funny thing about it, and that's why we don't have the certification, it's not recognized yet by the French uh, authorities. Uh, and the French <laughs> authorities are very complex. So um, we don't want to deal with this. Uh, so we didn't get the certification. Uh, so we're going to get the certification next year because the product is going to be recognized by the uh, institutions of the certification of organic wines. But we've been organic for, uh, uh, for many years now. So we use the horse, we use the tractor, uh, the harvest is done by hand, uh, bien sûr, and, um, and we use no chemistry whatsoever in the vineyard or in the chez except from um, uh, copper, and uh, sulfites, that's it. But not in the wine. Right. Uh, in the Chez, we use absolutely nothing. So uh, we just pick. Uh, we pick uh, usually uh, pretty early for people. Uh, normally, I would say that uh, compared to 90% of the people producing wine in Saint Emilion, we probably pick one week to 10 days before everyone. Uh, it's not a comparison, it's just a fact that uh, we want to keep a lot of acidity in the wines. And, uh, and I know that, um, that Merlot, by experience, uh, if you choose to do something uh, uh, too heavy and too rich, it doesn't work out and it doesn't have the expression of what uh, a Merlot is supposed to be in France. Um, I believe that if we wanted to produce Merlot the way many people produce Bordeaux, uh, Merlot in Bordeaux, uh, this we could do anywhere else in the world. Uh, the thing is, we're uh, in a cool climate, pretty cool, still pretty cool. And, uh, and it's very interesting to keep this um, acidity in the wine. So um, no use of any chemistry, no use of any technology except from this terming. Uh, we don't crush the grape. Uh, so it's uh, vinification integral most of the time. Um, we just do the pump pumping over. Um, my wife calls it a lazy wine. It, she does absolutely nothing. She supervises 
everything. We decide the most important part is uh, when we're going to pick. But um, voilà, that's the Vendange Intégrale. So that's the way we just put everything into the barrel. So that's, that's the Chateau Vieux Taper. Uh, we do exactly the same in VAT for the Pavillon. But we, we can't afford to do this for the Pavillon, but we do it for the Vieux Taper, which is we just put all the berries uh, uncrushed into a barrel. This is 100% new oak. But again, new oak for us is a different definition that, uh, that many uh, producers in saint Emilion or anywhere else. Um, uh, they, we've developed a technique of, um, of toasting with our uh, cooper. Uh, we do a six hour flame toast uh, with uh, temperature control. Uh, we make sure that, so it's French oak uh, from uh, Forêt de Jupille and Troncé. Uh, and we make sure that, uh, so, the, so the, 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 the actual flame is a small flame, very penetrating, but very uh, smooth uh, on the toast. So it's a six hour flame, which is pretty long. Usually the toast of a, a barrel is, a, is a 20 minutes maximum. Uh, it's a six hour flame, very small flame, and it's a, uh, a very uh, short toast. So it really burns from the inside, but it doesn't burn the wood. So if you look at the color, of the inside of the barrel, it's almost the same color as the outside of the barrel. So we want new oak to bring uh, some uh, kind, of kind of see wine. You can kind of see here the inside of the barrel um, yeah. in this photo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, yeah. the color you get is the color of the of the tannins and the antocyan on the um, from the berries, but not from the from not from the the toast. And then we use um, dry ice. Uh, to because we want a fermentation to start very smoothly inside the barrel, very very slowly. Um, so we do a prefermentation à froid. That's what my uh, wife learned from Petrus. Um, is that they we control the temperature from the very beginning to make sure that the fermentation starts inside the berry, uh, and not like a bottle of champagne to boost uh, and. Uh, and to uh, the fermentation starts too rapidly. Uh, we want it to be very, very, very smooth and slow. So you get a better extraction of the tannins, better extraction of the color, and um, a better definition on the wine. And of course, as Jean-Claude Berbe would say, le froid, c'est le fruit. Cold is fruit. <laughs> so we preserve the temperature for about 10 days. Uh, that's why you have this thermometer, thermometer on the barrel. We control the thermometer on the inside if, if the Term, uh, the temperature goes up uh, higher than 15 degrees. We add dry ice and then we start moving uh, the barrel to make sure that the temperature inside the barrel is um, below 15 degrees. And that we do for 10 days. When the fermentation starts, we control the temperature and it goes from 15 to 17. And then the next day, maybe 18. And two days later, 19, up to 30 degrees. But that's the only thing we control. The rest, uh, we just let it happen. Natural, uh, natural nature is uh, is made perfectly for the making of wine, and uh, the, the 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 two fermentations are made in barrels. And then, um, and then that's it. Uh, we just decide when. So these are barrels in the center. These are barrels we buy from Burgundy uh, for the Pavillon. Uh, that was actually uh, barrels from. Uh, 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 Domaine Guillon, Mazy Chambertin, uh, the 2015, if I can remember. Uh, so we never use New York for the Pavillon Taifer, only for the Vieux Taifer. Uh, we don't want any toast uh, or the toast to uh, dominate the wine on the Pavillon Taifer. It has to be an expression of a village wine. Uh, and that's the way we want to keep it, because that's the expression we want to keep on the wine. Uh, so it's exactly the same approach as. Um, as a, as a vin classique de Chateauneuf du Pape or, uh, uh, or a vin de village of Burgundy. The only difference maybe is that it's half the price of a village wine in Burgundy <laughs> and it's half the price of a Chateauneuf du Pape village classique. Uh, but in the winemaking, there's a, a lot of uh, care to the wine. And, uh, and, um, and voilà, that's the most important part. Uh, then when, so we pick pretty early the winemaking, as we told you. Uh, the vats we have are concrete vats for the Pavillon Taifer. Uh, we always separate all, every single uh, parcel. So they have all separate vinification and we do the, 
uh, the, the blend uh, in the very end. Uh, it's more or less always the same blend. If we, and if we're unhappy about one of the vats, we decide to sell the, 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 the content of the vat to the trade uh, bulk. It uh, happened twice, in 2013 and in 2011. Um, but usually we use 90% uh, of the production to produce the Pavillon Tefer. So the classic QV. Uh, no fining, no filtration, uh, no use of chemistry. The bottling we do ourselves. Um, so we control absolutely everything. Um, one very important thing, and that's for the, the economy, uh, economical uh, part, uh, we don't use the Place de Bordeaux and we never sell en primeur. So even in the distribution, uh, we uh, do it the Burgundy way. So we have uh, agents in France to distribute our wines in different areas of France. And for the, uh, the export, uh, we have one, one importer uh, for uh, the countries where we decide to sell uh, our wine. So the production is very limited. Altogether now, uh, it's uh, 30,000 bottles. When we can produce 30,000 bottles, which never really happens, but we try to. Um, the yields are not very low. Uh, that's very much of the Jean-Claude Berruy approach. Uh, when there was the fashion of uh, making the 24 hectoliter uh, per hectare production, uh, the less you were producing and the more you're concentrating the wines, uh, the better it was. That's not our approach. Uh, Jean-Claude Berruy has always said to us, maximum you can do is between 45 and 50 hectoliters per hectare. If you do more, it's a diluted wine. If you do less, it's not even better. Uh, so on, up to 50 hectoliters, it's reasonable and it's okay. Uh, so we don't do limited production, except from the wines that are limited by size, but not in the concentration uh, in the wine. Um, so only pumping over, no reverse osmosis, no use of tannins, no use of stems, no use of anything. Uh, except that the product I told you about, which is the uh, substitution to sulfides, that we only use twice. Once, when we pick, uh, as soon as we put all the grape into the, the vats, we use a little bit of the product. And then it's just when we put, and then the second part of uh, the use of this product is when we um, put the wine into the barrels. That's it. Nothing before the bottling. Uh, no headache. Uh, and um, and we've we've seen because uh, uh, Todd and uh, all of you from Dainisi, Rachel, uh, Dustin, you've had the wines for some time now, and you've never seen in the bottle some. Uh, and you're in a warm climate, and especially in California, uh, even by 90 degrees, uh, you don't see any uh, uh, change uh, in in the wine and uh, in the approach on the wine. The, uh, the, the, the smell, the, uh, the color uh, remains um, untouched, uh, which is not necessarily the case for Vin Naturel. We all know the problem <laughs> that uh, they can start refermenting again or uh, they can have some funny uh, expression on the nose. Uh, that doesn't happen. So we've had, uh, we have a little bit of feedback on these wines with the use of this product, especially in Hong Kong, where the climate is terrible for the preservation of wine. We, when we did the first uh, use of this, one, of this product, so the, 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 the person who introduced us to this product is, uh, is one of our close friends, is Anselm Celos from Domaine Jacques Celos in Champagne. I, I, should, I, I should inter, inter, interject here. Um, and I, I mentioned at the beginning, at the outset, I, uh, that we have a lot of friends in common. So, so Philippe, although he was um, a stay-at-home father for the first uh, two or three years when they were in, uh, in Bordeaux, uh, when Catherine was working for Jean-Claude Berroway, um, he has since uh, also started his own business. Um, and and in, the, in, in the last several years has built a, a really great business as a, a, an importer and distributor of wine. Um, now he also does the winemaking alongside uh, Catherine uh, for the Vieux Thai Fair, of course, but, um, but he, uh, he's quite busy 
um, with his full-time job as well, which is importer and distributor. And he represents many of the same domains that DNS imports to the U.S., uh, like Patrick Pugh's from Chablis, like Emmanuel Rouget from Burgundy, um, like uh, Etienne Julien from Domaine Julien in Burgundy, and, and several others. So this is, this is how we were connected originally. In fact, it was, it was really Patrick Pugh's who kept pushing on me, saying, you have to talk to Philippe, you have to meet my friend Philippe, taste his wines. And he was the one who gave me the first bottles of Butai Fair and said, just try them. Um, that finally convinced me to to pick up the phone and call Philippe. Um, so uh, so one of the but one of the wines that uh, that Philippe also represents and sells in uh, in France is uh, Domaine Jacques Salos Champagne, um, and he's very close friends with Ansem Salos and in fact Guillaume Salos, who is kind of assuming more and more of the control of uh, Domaine Jacques Salos now from his father Ansem. Uh, Guillaume Salos did his uh, internship, his stage w at uh, Chateau Vieux Taifer in 2010. Is that correct? 2011, two years in a row. Two years. Okay, so so that's where Anselm sent his son was to 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 work with Philippe and Catherine uh, for his internship, which is great. And uh, so that's that's the the origin story there. So anyway, sorry, continue, Philippe. Yeah. So well, you know, so uh, when we did the first test of this product, Guillaume was doing his test in 2010. So we said, okay, we you need to have. Uh, you're not just going to do uh, clean the floor and do the winemaking uh, along with Catherine. Uh, you need to have a subject you need to work on. And uh, I want to do the experimentation of the use of this product your father told me about. So we're going to experiment this on one barrel. That was the 2010 Vieux Taifer. We did one barrel with the use of this product. And we sold the entire production of this 2010 from this barrel to our importer in Hong Kong because we thought this is the worst place to send the wine to. And when we will travel to uh, uh, Hong Kong in three years' time, we'll figure out if the wine survived uh, the, uh, the, the, the um, being in Hong Kong with very high temperatures, a lot of humidity, I mean, the, best, the worst climate possible. <laughs> and when we were there in 2014, uh, we tasted all the wines with the importer, went to different restaurants, which I loved, and, uh, and the wine was just fine. So we thought, okay, from now on, uh, we're, uh, we're going to use this product for the entire production. The only problem is it's very expensive. It's about 1.5 euro per bottle. But that's fine. That's okay. Uh, so we didn't want to change the price for any of our uh, customers worldwide or even France. We just decided, I, I have nothing against sulfites. Sulfites is fine if you use a, a tiny amount of it. It's just that uh, I, I love the definition you get in the wine uh, by using... You know, it, when, when we, you start the, 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 the vinification of the wine and you have your wine in the white and the juice comes out and you use this product for the first time, you see that the interaction of sulfites compared to this product is huge. Because when you use sulfites, you just spread some sulfites, you need to protect your face, not because of the COVID-19 or whatever it is. You need to protect your face because it's very smelly. It's very, it burns your face. It's, it, it's, uh, it, 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 it's chemistry. It's solid chemistry, like uh, pure sulfides being dropped in a in a in a twenty five hectoliter. Uh, uh, you need to to take some kind of precautions not to burn yourself. Uh, it burns your eyes, makes you cry. Um, this product, it smells like if you open the bottle, it smells it smells like uh, um, like chartreuse. chartreuse. It smells like chartreuse. Uh, you just pour it in the in thing, and you see immediately that even on the wine, on the juice, it has no effect. Once you put some sulfites on top of the juice, you immediately have an interaction, which is from dark red, it goes to orange, because it's burned. And this product, immediately when you pour it on the wine, it has absolutely no effect, except from protecting uh, the wine from uh, oxidization. Uh, then you do the pumping over and, uh, and uh, <clears throat> and your wine is protected, and your wine is protected. What I like about this product, except for the fact that it's very expensive, uh, it, it is that uh, I find a better definition in the wine. And again, I have nothing against sulfites. If I have to use sulfites again, we use tiny amounts if we had to, but it's fine. But I like the idea of using this product. Um, we don't advertise it uh, necessarily. On the, there's no communication, new communication about it. Um, we are the only ones to use it in Bordeaux right now. Uh, for many people, they find it too risky. Uh, we figured out 
from the very beginning when Guillaume Cello started doing the vinification with us in 2010, doing one barrel, bottling, and tasting the difference between the one we used sulfides and without sulfides, that the difference was significant. Uh, so that's why we, where we decided to use this product full time, full time. Um, so, okay, it has an effect on the price, uh, on the cost price of the production, but that's okay. We'll be producing some Bergerac at two euros. That'd be a different issue. Uh, we're producing saint Emilion, So uh, the effect uh, is, 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 is still there, but it's not that huge. Uh, and, and again, I find a real difference in the definition on the wine. So we'll keep using this product from now on. Uh, and I believe that in the future, it'll be less expensive because uh, maybe more and more people will be using it. Don Celos doesn't use it because he doesn't need it. Uh, he has bubbles, he has CO2. He gets natural protection from his own production. He doesn't use it. He used tiny amounts of sulfites, but he recommended out, he recommended the product uh, for us to use the product. And it's probably the best advice he's ever given me. <laughs> Except from the whites. Except, and how to make white wine, right? <laughs> Except from, uh, well, well, because we had no clue. And my, my wife only did a <laughs> tiny, had a, only a tiny experience of doing uh, uh, a little bit of uh, white wine in puligny Morache, But that was a long time ago with uh, Domaine Pernod in puligny Morache. Uh, <laughs> well, very good experience. We'll have to tell the, you have to tell the story about the, um, how you even discovered the white wine and uh, that you make and, and the story about uh, racing back from the Alps. But, uh, but bef before we get to the, uh, <laughs> before we get to the white wine, I want to, I want to go through, uh, so, uh, I think a couple of people that are joining us today might have um, the white wine with them, but, um, but for the most part, um, if, if they've got some of your wines, they've got the uh, Pavillon de Taille Fair and the Chateau Vieux Taille Fair. Um, so maybe we should jump into the wines and um, talk a little, a little bit more specifically about the differences between the two. You, you've talked a little bit already about, you know, the, the philosophy, you know, and, and the Pavillon de Taille Fair is like your, your village wine and then the Vieux Taille Fair is the, the premier cru. Uh, but, but a little bit more specifically, the differences um, maybe in the, the terroir and, and, um, and then any, any differences in winemaking or anything else that, uh, that separate the two. Uh, might be might be a good time to talk about that. Uh, so you mean on the red or on the white? No, no. Could you hear me? Am I? Yeah. yeah sorry. Oh yeah. So so the 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 Pavillon de Taille Fair and the Vieux Taille Fair, the two reds, kind of the. Oh, the, the difference. Diff okay. The difference is terroir driven. So you definitely uh, it's it's it is as obvious as if you were a producer in Burgundy, you have a village wine, and another one called uh, and another another location which is definitely a premier cru or a grand cru. Uh, so as we're terroir driven, we realized that we had a village wine and then a premier cru or a grand cru. And the Vieux Taillefer is a parcel that we have is a little bit less than one hectare. Very, very old vines. The average age is uh, 80, 85 years old uh, in Saint Christophe des Bardes on the, what we call the nicest part of Saint Emilion for the terroir. Uh, our, our neighbors are very well known neighbors, uh, Chateau Trollomondo. And um, what else do we have? Larcis Ducas. We have uh, <coughs> many of the big names. Um, so these are the really, really nice terroir. And we have very old wines of, uh, vines of Merlot. This is a parcel we bought in 2010. Uh, and another story, another funny story uh, that um, before that we were producing a Vieux Taillefer, which was the parcel uh, with the stony part. Now the Vieux Taillefer is only the production of the parcel we have in in, uh, in um, Saint Christophe des Barbes. And and the and just to clarify for everyone, so that that parcel in Saint Christophe des Barbes uh, that's a little less than one hectare yeah. that produces the Vieux Taillefer. The the key difference between that parcel and the others is that's up on the plateau and it's basically pure limestone. Is that correct? It's pure limestone. Pure limestone. And it didn't make any sense to blend this with the rest of the other production. It didn't make any sense. We had two different wines. We had a boy and a girl. So it had no, it had no meaning to uh, blend these two together. Uh, so, um, so this parcel, we did a separate vine making. It's what we call the single vineyard. Um, very old vines. Again, 85 years old, 90 years old, maybe on the average. Um, tiny production because it's very old. 
uh, and it's small. We only produce 3,000 bottles. So it's very limited. And, uh, and this parcel we bought in 2011. Same story as the first story, another old man with no inheritance who didn't want to sell to any of his neighbors. And uh, he decided to sell this parcel to us because he was introduced, uh, uh, he, he was into, he, we, we, we were introduced by Jean-Claude Darwin again. And uh, so we decided to buy this parcel. Again, no money to buy it. A good compromise that we managed to get this parcel. And one of the reasons he accepted to sell this parcel to us is, well, okay, so one, he didn't know us. Two, we weren't any of the neighbors, especially uh, the guy from Pabi who was chasing him for a big, long time. Um, the price was much higher than anything we bought before, uh, but it's the very noble part of saint -Emilion. So we decided to buy this uh, parcel. And he said, there's another condition where I accept to sell this parcel is that uh, uh, this, the parcel is separated in two parts. 90% is uh, a little bit less than one hectare. And then you have a tiny parcel, which is a little bit further uh, on the road, same road. But I want to keep this parcel at least for two, three years, five years, six years. And then I'll lend it to you. But uh, in the meantime, I want to keep this because I want to still, I still want to produce some wine and make my own production and drink my own wine. So we said, okay, okay fine. This is no issue whatsoever. You can keep this small parcel and you know what? You're 80 years old. We'll do the work in the vineyard and all you have to do is pick and do your own wine making and make your own production and drink your own wine. So we were, he was very happy with that. And we were ha very happy with that. The thing is in 2011 during the summer, uh, we got a phone call from this old man. He said, okay, I just saw my doctor and we're not, I'm not allowed to drink wine anymore. So I cannot keep this parcel and I cannot drink wine and I cannot keep it. So you can have it. I said, okay, fine. You know, it's 2011 now. It's only the very beginning of September. And it's going to be a late harvest this year because it's not mature at all. So there's no rush. We're in the Alps uh, having our vacation and uh, nothing is going to happen within two, three weeks. So no rush. He said, yeah, yeah, you should hurry up because I've been in the vineyard and I've tasted the, the grapes and they're mature. I said, what are you talking about? It cannot be mature. Beginning of September, it cannot be mature. He said, no, 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 I promise you, I've tasted the Merlot and it's Merlot and, and, I, and it's, it is pretty mature. I said, no, no, wait, I've tasted my own grapes two weeks ago and we were miles away from uh, uh, the, 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 the right time when we were gonna pick. So uh, you, you must be wrong. He said, no, 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 I've also tasted the, uh, the Sauvignon and they're pretty uh, mature. I said, Sauvignon, Cabernet Sauvignon, how can it be mature? Cabernet Sauvignon cannot be mature um, early September. It's going to be mature uh, probably mid-October in 2011. What are you talking about? He said, no, 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 the Sauvignon Blanc. I said, excuse me, in saint christophe des Bar, you're talking about uh, uh, Sauvignon Blanc? What, what do you mean? There's no Sauvignon Blanc in, uh, in saint Emilion." He said, no, 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 my parcel is white. I said, what are you talking about? You just told me you had some Merlot. He said, yes, it's a white Merlot. I said, what are you talking about? I've never heard about white Merlot. There's no white Merlot. So I thought this guy was losing his head. He was 84 years old and I thought he was totally losing it. So I said, what do you, what do you have in this parcel? Uh, we've done the work in the, vineyard, in the parcel. We've seen the grape. We never saw the color actually because it was still green or just starting to, uh, you did the, the picking, but we never saw the color of the grape. And to us, it was obvious being in saint that it was red. It had to be red. Everything is 99.99% red in saint -Emilion. He said, no, this entire parcel is white. I have Merlot white, I have Sauvignon Blanc, I have Saint-Emilion, I have Chasselas, I have Sauvignon Gris, and I have Muscadel. Wow. Okay. So we're thinking about having our uh, vacation to last a little bit longer in the Alps, where we just rushed back into saint Emilion. On the way back to saint Emilion, I called my friend Anselm Seros, uh, because he's the king of white uh, uh, wines and the vacation of white. So I said, you know what? I have Merlot Blanc. He said, I can't believe you. This is impossible. So that was in 2011. And I said, what am I going to do? I don't even have the equipment to do the white, the, the vinification of the white. I need a specific press. My press is useless for the, the use of wine wine. So he said, okay, you know, my son is going to join you uh, within two weeks of the vinification. It's his second year doing his stage with you. So um, 
I'll just make sure that he, he's going to carry, uh, uh, how do you call it? A remorque, Todd. Uh, uh, like, a, like a trailer. 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 A trailer with a, a small press, six to liter press. So you do the wine making and the whites. I said, okay, but how do we do this? He said, what do you have? How, what is the size of the parcel? I gave him the size of the parcel, the different grape varieties. It's okay, your parcel is tiny. You're gonna have to make sure that the majority of the grapes that are mature, you just pick. With the stems, you press directly into the barrels. First winemaking of the 2011 uh, was, uh, for, for the white wine was 2011. We thought, okay, the total amount is 2,400, maybe 3,000 bottles at the most every year. So we thought, okay, we're gonna do exactly like the old man. We're gonna keep this wine for our own production, for our own consumption, sorry. But one day I had my uh, Japanese importer who uh, showed up uh, at the domain to taste the new vintage. And he saw uh, the vat written on it, vin blanc. So he said, what is this? So I, I had to tell him the story. And he said, I want it all. I want to taste it and I want it all. Okay. Uh, I, didn't, I wasn't intended to sell this wine until he decided he wanted it because he had sushi in Japan and uh, they were having fish uh, and he wanted the production. So we gave him 600 bottles of the production and kept the rest of it. Then we had to show the wines to uh, the, uh, the French authorities uh, to get it labeled Bordeaux. And we told them the history of this parcel and the fact that we had some Merlot Blanc. And they said, we don't recognize Merlot Blanc being part of uh, saint Emilion anymore. Okay, that's interesting. Uh, but listen, I've studied the whole history of saint Emilion, And I realized that when I look into the books, 70% of the wines 100 years ago on the right bank were white wines. And the great majority of it was Merlot Blanc. So how can you tell me that you don't recognize Merlot Blanc as being part of uh, uh, the history of Saint-Emilion? It is the history. <laughs> it, was, it is actually the history of Saint-Emilion. And actually the parcels that are in saint of Debaud, where this parcel is located, is dedicated for the make of very great white wines just like uh, the Chardonnay uh, is a perfect combination in Avis on the Côte des Blancs for Champagne for Anselm Celos, or uh, Domaine Pernod uh, in puligny Morachet. So these are terroir for the Blanc. So looking into the books, I saw that the history was that when the, the Brits made the classification in 1855, uh, the uh, right bank decided to remove all the whites from the right bank because they want to copy paste what was being done on the left bank and to get their own classification and to get as noble as the left bank and to sell their wines because the wines weren't selling at the time. The whites were very difficult to sell. It was a local consumption. And they were seeing all these Brits buying in Belgium, people from Belgium, from Germany, uh, buying all these wines from the left bank and, and the right bank wasn't selling because it was white, 70%. So they decided to remove the Merlot Blanc, and of course you have the, uh, uh, now it's planted 80% with Merlot Blanc, uh, Merlot Red, uh, but it was the Merlot Blanc. Merlot Blanc has totally disappeared from saint Emilion, and we are the only ones now using Merlot Blanc, uh, originally because the vines are 95 years old. Uh, uh, the actual Merlot Blanc from the right bank uh, in, um, in saint Emilion. Uh, we're now trying to extend um, the surface of uh, production of the Blanc uh, because we love the wine. We find it beautiful. So we did a, uh, how do you say, Selection Massal? They, they, uh, they, they, they understand Massal selection. Selection Massal selection of uh, our Merlot Blanc. And uh, hopefully we'll find some areas, not necessarily in the saint Emilion. We don't need to. Um, because we were rejected from the Appalachian Bordeaux because they believe that Merlot Blanc doesn't belong to Bordeaux anymore. Um, so it's, that's why it's a vin de table uh, or vin de France. Uh, and that's the reason why we decided to choose this shape of bottle. Uh, we are, both my wife and myself, big fans 
of wines from the Jura and the Vin Jaune, and we wanted to use the same bottle as the, the, the wines from the Vin Jaune. Uh, we're not allowed to because Vin Jaune uh, shape bottle is protected by the uh, ENO. Uh, so we managed to find a, a shape of a bottle uh, which is close to what uh, you can find in the Jura, but we didn't want to use uh, the Bordeaux white shape uh, because they didn't recognize us as being part of Bordeaux. So there's no reason why we should use a bottle of Bordeaux because it's not even Bordeaux on the label. Uh, so we're happy with this bottle. It's beautiful. It was very difficult to make a, <coughs> a wooden case out of it, but we managed to find someone who did it. Uh, uh, so that's the story of the white. So we've been producing white from since 2011. It's a very limited production. Um, at the most, we do 3,000 bottles. Um, and today, uh, I think half of the production goes to the U.S. <laughs> uh, yeah. So that's our decision. A little bit less to Japan, but uh, uh, mainly to the U.S. Cool. Um, all right. So I think, uh, well, we've hit on, uh, we've covered the story. We, we're, we're right at an hour almost. We've got the, the story, the, how you guys came to uh, arrive at this place. <laughs> Um, and uh, the differences in some of the wines. Uh, hopefully you guys have been tasting while Philippe has been talking about the, uh, the wines and the, the property and, and the story and history and everything else. Um, I love the story about the white wine and how that came about. It's very funny um, to think of, of the two of them on the phone having this conversation back and forth, neither one understanding what the other is talking about um, and, uh, and racing back and, and calling on some solo saying, how the hell do I make white wine? <laughs> That's great. Um, and it just so happens that it's, it's, uh, it, it's worked. It's been a great success. Cause I, you know, people who try the wine, um, even without the story, love the wine and it is so, uh, so, so, so unique. Uh, but then when you get the story along with it, it's, it's hard not to love, absolutely love this wine. Um, and I can attest to, uh, uh, Philippe's been generous enough to share some older vintages of the, of this, uh, of the white, whenever I go have, have been to visit him. And, um, I absolutely love how this thing ages, um, in my opinion, it's actually best when it's got a few years in the bottle. Um, but uh, uh, so, so hopefully the, you guys have a little bit better sense of understanding about the property. I think at this point, um, it's probably a good time, though, to, to ask if anybody's got any specific questions, whether it be technical on the winemaking side or, or, uh, or anything more about, uh, about Philippe and their story and, and uh, on that angle, whatever, whatever. Um, uh, now's a, a good time to ask some questions and feel free. Um, so I know some people may have to jump off now that we're at an hour, but if uh, uh, I've got time, I think Philippe has some time. If you, if we want to linger here for a little bit and do a little bit of a Q and A. Yeah, one thing that I wanted to add to the thing oh. that's much more of a, uh, the distribution part, uh, as I mentioned to you, we don't use the Place de Bordeaux for the distribution. We only have one importer in the U S that's it. Uh, and it's the same for all the other countries where we export our wines to. Uh, that means we don't do any, uh, sales. We've, we've identified the problems with Bordeaux and the main problems with Bordeaux is not on necessarily on the winemaking because again I have nothing against Bordeaux we just do our own things we have our own venture and we do it our own way um, but what I've identified being in the business is that uh, the sale of Bordeaux en primeur uh, the sale of Bordeaux by the négociant and the courtier and probably a winemaker is a complete mistake is a complete mistake uh, the wines, especially if you use a consultant, look the same. They have the same signature. Uh, that's why we're very close from Burgundy and, uh, and many small producers, small growers uh, from many different parts of France and even Europe. Um, and that's something we're very uh, uh, keen uh, to, uh, to keep because uh, we're never going to use any consultant. We're never going to sell en primeur. And, and especially the other part, which I hate about Bordeaux, is the pricing. Uh, the pricing gets really, really complicated for many people. When you have a sexy vintage, uh, the prices go up maybe by 100%. Uh, and then the next year, if it's 2013, then they'll um, give you a 20% discount because it's a little bit not as good as the, the 2010. But sorry, the, the difference is huge. huge. Uh, we maintain the same price. Uh, and we will do in the future. There's no reason why we should uh, raise the price. Is that every single vintage 
from the 2016, which I believe being one of the best on the right bank since 1998 <coughs> and 89. Uh, it's going to be exa exactly the same price as the 2018, 2019. Uh, <coughs> and there's no re reason why it should go up and down because that is very complicated for a consumer <coughs> to understand this, um, what I call the yo-yo effect uh, in, the, in the pricing. That doesn't make sense. So that's one of the things I wanted to mention. Uh, excuse me, uh, Taylor is asking what the, the name of the sulfur substitute is. If you could just type it in um, t yeah, so I that everyone can see it. E-P-Y-C-A. E-P-I-C-A, E-P-Y-C-A, sorry. So you have Ipica for the white and for the red. It is not the same product. Uh, for the white, it's less concentrated. No, sorry. For the red, it's less concentrated than the white. The right hasn't got tannin, so it's got much more uh, uh, polyphenol in the product. So EPYCA, uh, it's made from Swiss industry. It's 100% organic. Uh, and uh, it is extracted from the seed by ultrason. How do you call it? Ultrason. Oh, uh, ultrasound. Same word. Ultrasound. Same in English. So when I'm looking for a word, it's the same word in French. Okay. So <laughs> ultrasound. Uh, so it's liquid. As I said, it's like chartreuse, and you add it to the product, uh, to the wine, to the to just into the vat. Very easy, very easy. Uh, it doesn't have funny smell. Uh, it is funny on the smell. It's like chartreuse again, but it's yeah. less funny than a, than a bottle of sulfur. Uh, and uh, and we just love it. It's 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 a great use. It's a great use. <laughs> um, and and Daniel uh, Posner from uh, from New York. Has a couple of questions. He he asked one: If is the white wine still about three thousand bottle production? Um, yeah, that'd be the maximum. Actually, we never managed three thousand bottles. Hmm. That's probably the ma the maximum we would be able to produce compared to the size of the pro the uh, of the um, the uh, the parcel. parcel. Mm -hmm. um, and then his his next question was, uh, uh, which I think you mentioned, but maybe I'm misremembering. Uh, do any other producers in Bordeaux use Epica? No, not that I know about. Some people have been experimenting uh, the thing. Uh, you know, the main difference in Bordeaux is that we hardly have any uh, relationship with any of the producers in Bordeaux mm. because we're not on the Place de Bordeaux, so we don't go to any of the meetings. We don't use any consultants, so we don't get to go to any of the meetings of the consultants. We don't sell en primeur, so we're not even part of the exhibition they do during the en primeur. Uh, so our relationship, and I'm in the business, and I don't sell any Bordeaux. So uh, it makes it very difficult for me to have some kind of relationship with our neighbors. The only links we have is maybe Jean-Claude Berwe, but uh, he's now retired. And a few neighbors and a few people I know. I see people at school because I have four kids and I get to see people at school when I see the parents. They all work more or less in the industry. And I hate the world industry anyway, but I mean, it's a... It's a um, so we, we just have our own venture. The people you know, we know, are not in Bordeaux. And it's the people we uh, uh, share as uh, distributors. My friends are René Barbier from the Clomogador. It's Patrick Puse in Chablis. It's uh, Guillaume Roger from Domaine Roger. It's Maxime Serlin from Domaine Georges Noëlla. It is the Anselm family, uh, the Celos family. It is the La Herte family. It is the uh, Berech family, the Savard family. Uh, these people are people we're very close to, but not in Bordeaux. We don't have the, the same, uh, it's not the same scenario. I, I, and again, I respect them, uh, but it's, um, it's just a different approach. I wasn't born in Bordeaux and I don't have very strong links in Bordeaux uh, from the town of Bordeaux and even in Saint-Emilion. My kids were born in Saint-Emilion, except from Emma, the big one, uh, but that's it. And we live here, we love it. It's beautiful, we're by the river, uh, you know the place. Uh, but we're not part of any of the exhibition, the shows, the, uh, the business yeah. itself. Uh, we don't even buy the barrels from the local cooper. Uh, we buy the, the, the barrels from a, a guy from Burgundy. Um, we don't buy any of the products, so we don't even go to the shop next door uh, to buy all the chemistry people use. Um, so uh, it made us a bit of, a, a bit of the, 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 the clues of saint Emilion. the... the, the, the Still foreigners, of course, uh, because uh, because we weren't born in Saint-Emilion. Uh, 
but we're fine with the terroir of Saint Emilion. We're happy about. Philippe, I have a question about wine style and yes. specifically to your estate, and then also maybe more generally what's going on in, in Bordeaux. I think people that have your samples to taste today might find um, that. I mean, it's been our experience, and we've talked about this before that. Um, uh, the wines that you and Catherine make, um, we talked about the, the Burgundian qualities of how you uh, conceptualize your village wine versus your premier crew or grand crew, but also just stylistically the wines themselves. I mean, if you're tasting them today, you see that they have really quite beautiful and long um, tannin chains and they're are really quite silky. They, they have elements of of uh, forest floor and, and some mushroomy qualities that I would equate and most everyone else would equate more with Burgundy than they would with Bordeaux. Um, what is it that you guys do to get that? Is it the whole berry fermentation? Um, is it uh, both from a technical standpoint, if you could speak to that a little bit, as opposed to the more classic structured rigid wines? And then also, is this a general movement that you're seeing um, on the right bank anyway, specifically, or is, or is this just something that you guys are, are after? So, so the, the, the answer is, 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 is a bit of a frustrating answer. We do nothing. We do nothing at all, which is no intervention. Our wine is not a signature. It's not an ego of a man who does uh, the winemaking at a beautiful estate and who's paid by the owner of a, a rich property. It is just the picking of uh, the grape at the moment where we believe it's the right timing. And then we try to preserve the, the fruit as clean as possible into the shape. And we start the, the supervising the fermentation. It's not a signature. Uh, there's no chemistry. There's no recipe. Um, it's just, as Jean-Claude Berwe would say from Petrus, that's the, probably the best advice he's ever done to us, uh, given to us, is... Um, uh, it's like it's like a jewel, and you're gonna figure out uh, from the size of the, the the stone what shape you're gonna give to it, and that's it. Uh, the rest is only supervising. Uh, that means, of course, no use of chemistry whatsoever, no high toasts on the barrels uh, to keep the balance as much as possible with a lot of acidity, because that's freshness and fruit. Uh, I'm a drinker. I like to drink wine, and I like to drink a lot of wine. <laughs> I cannot manage it. I'm 50 years old, close to, I'm going to be 50 soon. Um, I cannot afford to drink a bottle of wine, which is 15.5, um, hyper-concentrated, with a lot of wood. That doesn't work out. I like to eat and to drink. And if I want to enjoy my food and my wine, it has to be something that I can digest. It has something that it's going to be nice to me. I'm an old man now, so I have to, to, uh, to, um, <laughs> to protect myself from drinking very, very heavy wines. Um, it, it doesn't work with me. If you, if you ask me what wines from Chateau neuf du I, I drink, there's only a few. And one of the few I drink is the one I distributed that Dénès imports. It's the Clos du Caillou, uh, because there's a lot of freshness in the wines. And I find the wines uh, with absolutely beautiful definition but I cannot af afford to drink, and I don't like to drink, the very, very heavy wine. So there's no intervention in the winemaking, except from supervising and making sure that nothing goes wrong. And I think nothing else, uh, nothing else. I think uh, it's great to uh, use uh, barrels. I like defining in, in aging in barrels, but again, I have to be very cautious about the, uh, uh, the toast, uh, we all know, we've all experienced uh, the, the, the wines from the early uh, 2000, 2000, until 2000 wine in Bordeaux. They keep tell us, telling us every year that they're going to change the winemaking and there's going to be less wood and less uh, use of uh, new oak and very high toast. But it's, it's not true. And I, 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 I still need to, the, the wines that I enjoy from Bordeaux are the wines from the 90s today, not because they're old, because the style was very different. And at the time, because my wife was doing the winemaking at La Fleur Petrus in 95, she told me exactly what she was doing. And there's nothing different we're doing. We don't have the same terroir, that's for sure. But in the winemaking, 
it's the same approach. No intervention. You have a distemmer, you don't crush, you put all the berries in the vats, you, super, you do a little bit of cold to make sure that the fermentation doesn't start immediately. And you, then you control. You control the temperature and that's it. Pumping over, delistage to activate the, 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 the lees and the yeasts, natural yeast, no use of yeast, no use of yeast, definitely no use of yeast. Uh, so it's all natural yeast from the skin. And that's it. And then you have the fermentation, uh, alcoholic fermentation, and the malolactic fermentation, and then the fining, and then the and then you just put it in the barrels and you supervise again, control the temperature, and then just wait. Wait, so, wait, wait, wait. I think I think what uh, I think everyone that's been been following along the, the call here can probably figure out. And you probably heard Philippe use the expression uh, half a dozen times or so on the call today, uh, no chemistry. Um, and I think the takeaway here in summation, in fact, if, you'll, if, if I may be so bold, is that it's, mu it's not about what they do at Chateau de Vitae Fair. It's more about what they don't do. Um, and something that I've learned from, uh, from Philippe over the years and visiting the estate and talking with him and Catherine and, 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 and learning more about not only what they do, but also just about the area in general is there is a lot of chemistry <laughs> that goes on in the, in the Bordeaux region. And, and um, uh, we, we probably don't have time to get into it today, but uh, maybe uh, the next time we're all together, or if uh, you're, you're around Philippe and we're having beers or wine, um, Philippe can tell you the story about the, the consultant that they uh, – that they uh, that they had come visit their winery one time. Um, I will just tell you that the end of that story it ends with Catherine unceremoniously kicking him out of the winery. So, um, but it's a great story. Uh, but it will shed a lot of light on kind of what what goes on at a lot of these estates. Some of them very very big names that you would know um, in Bordeaux. Um, so I think I think the important thing with Butai Fair to, to 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 take away from this is it's it is it's about what they don't do more than anything else. Um, Anyway, so the other thing we don't do is that we don't show the wines to the press, mm. uh, because we all know that Bordeaux is totally influenced by the the role of uh, the the American press, especially, um, and uh, the rating uh, and the uh, the the anxiety <laughs> people were having about what what rating they were going to get. Uh, we decided not to show the wines to the press. One of the reasons that mainly the press only shows up to the shows we never go to. And the imprimeur, uh, we don't go, we don't go there. We don't show the wine, so we don't need to show the wines to the press. And it had absolutely no effect on uh, the, um, the sale of the wine and the pricing and the success of the wine on the markets. So uh, it was fine. Um, I've got a couple of questions in the chat here that I want to get to. Uh, one is, uh, says um, about talking about the, sorry, I had to scroll back up and find it. Um, sorry if you're tired of addressing this, but would love to hear any thoughts or observations you have on the fate of Merlot, uh, given the, the whole issue of uh, global warming and the changing climate. What do you see there? Okay, so the global warming at uh, what we've experienced ourselves uh, is not at this stage drastic. Um, it's not drastic. It's there. It is obviously there. What I fear more about the climate changing is that how hysterical the, the climate goes in some periods of time. We have some drastic changes within 24 hours. It's brutal. Brutal. When I mean brutal, it is violent. Mm -hmm. You can have a storm, a hail storm, which is We've always had a hailstorm in the past or frost or any of the experimentations you get as a winemaker or a owner of a, of a land in saint Emilion or anywhere else in Europe. But the violence, the, 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 the frequency the right? of, of how things happen is unbelievable. Uh, I remember the 2013 experience. I was, I was packing the car. We were leaving on holiday on the early, first of August, it was getting really, really warm. And then I went to bed, went to catch a pizza because I didn't want to do co any cooking. We would leave early in the morning to leave and take the kids uh, to some nice place for the, the vacation. And I just was closing the curtains and the wind started blowing, but 
big time, big time. And the, the clouds were dark, like literally black. And I was seeing all the, the, the clouds coming towards me. And I said to my wife, you know what? I think this is the end. We're just going to lose the entire production. We're going to lose the property. We're going to lose the property. And that's almost what happened. It devastated everything, but everything. We have all our parcels in every single different parts. And that's, we did it on purpose because we don't want, if, if, if you get the hailstorm, one might be affected, but not the others. In 2013, it affected the entire Appalachian. The entire Appalachian. So we're talking about 80% we lost. 80%, which is and, an absolute chaos. And it seems like so all that's these... That's something really, I'm really concerned about. On the winemaking, though, on the winemaking, though, we always take the decision uh, to do an early picking. So it may be changed from one day to two days. Uh, and that makes a big difference. Uh, we're still very concerned about, uh, about this. But we're still very far from the growing of Merlot in California. Yeah. Uh, the temperature we get is still very cool. Um, you know, to, at, at night, for example, at night, for example, the temperature we get um, would be 15 degrees Celsius. Uh, 59 in, degrees Fahrenheit. So that's nothing compared to what you would get in Spain, even in Spain, or Italy, yeah. or uh, in Bulgaria, for example. Um, it's much warmer. Uh, that has an effect on Merlot, and I believe the the Merlot that I like to drink are not necessarily from the ones from Bulgaria or California, uh, uh, because they have, have a complete different. Uh, um, there will be there will be a change. Uh, uh, there will be a change, I believe, in the future. Uh, that wouldn't make us use the Cabernet Franc because it's definitely a wrong casting. Uh, but for the Merlot at this stage, with our short experience of 10 to 15 years old, at this stage, it's fine. We still manage to produce some wines that are uh, fine, elegant, and fresh. All right. So here's another question um, about the white wine. Uh, can you talk about the white wine um, when, you, when you're harvesting, what the percentages are of the different grapes? Well, it's, and so it's very difficult because it's a small parcel and all the... Uh, the different grape varieties are planted together in the same uh, area. So it's very small. We just pick. So the majority is Merlot Blanc, 70%. So when the Merlot Blanc is mature, we just pick everything. We press everything together in that small press we kept uh, that is uh, that uh, our Sam Sellers lend us. Uh, so it's a pneumatic press, uh, 662 liters. Uh, with the stems, we press everything together into a container, we do a lot of cold for 24 hours, and then we move it to um, a cigar-shaped um, 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 barrel, uh, new oak, 100% new oak, of 300 liters. Uh, so we wanna keep a long surface of leaves in contact with the juice. We do no batonnage. So again, no intervention on the wine. Uh, a little bit of racking, but that'll be it. Uh, and that's it, and the fermentation starts inside the barrel. So the juice starts fermenting inside the barrel. And, and am I muted? No. Um, and the, the last part of his question was, and this is Pat, you said, what classic wines do you think they compare to? Pat, do you mean, do you mean classic wines from Bordeaux? Uh, just like, I, it didn't come across to me as like classic Bordeaux. So like, what, it seems like you, you, you said that you were a big drinker. So what are, what are some wines that you feel like, I'm not saying they pinpoint like direct comparison, but what are some wines you think of when you drink your white? Honestly, I, I've, uh, it's, it's, it's my favorite drink to have it blind with people around me. Nobody can figure out what it is. It doesn't look like anything else. It doesn't look like Sancerre, even if it has a little bit of a Sauvignon Blanc. It doesn't like, look like Bordeaux Blanc. It probably tastes like a white Bordeaux from the right bank that was produced 150 years ago. <laughs> Good answer. But I've never managed to experience that. Uh, but again, uh, it doesn't taste like Riesling. It doesn't taste like Alsace. It doesn't like, taste like the Loire Valley. Uh, and actually, the first time 
Um, there was a, the world champion sommelier called Olivier Poussier who went to a restaurant in uh, Bordeaux and the sommelier gave him a, a, a blind tasting of our wine. And he said, this is a lovely wine. I don't know what it is. The only thing I can tell you about is, it's definitely not Bordeaux. <laughs> Here's the answer. Uh, it doesn't taste like any other wine. I, I wouldn't compare it to any other wine. Um, it's very floral. So, okay, on the definition, you would compare it to white flowers. Uh, it's like a little bit of jasmine. Uh, it's a little bit citric, but not too much. Um, doesn't taste at all like Chardonnay. Um, no, it's totally unique uh, by the small amount of production it has. Uh, and because we are only ones to own this uh, in terms of Merle Blanc, and that's so lucky. I mean, being a total novelty in uh, Saint-Emilion and being able to be the only owner of Merlot Blanc uh, in Bordeaux is, is great. I, uh, I, I, I love it. And I love the, the shape of the bottle. And originally, when we first started uh, drinking it with my wife, we thought, we want to keep this for ourselves. Um, the reason the guy had this and he kept it, the ex-owner, is because he had a house. You know, we're only an hour drive from the, the, the sea. Uh, if you go to Arcachon or the Café, it's only an hour drive. So all these wealthy people from the right bank, they all had a house by the sea. And the reason why he kept this Merlot Blanc is because he was bringing back from the house from the sea some sea bass, some oysters, and some uh, uh, um, uh, crustacea. Uh, uh, Different uh, shellfish. Shellfish. What else? Yeah. So that's the reason why he kept it. That's the only reason why he kept it for his own consumption that would go with fish. Uh, and luckily we managed to buy this parcel. Uh, and, and hopefully in the future we'll, 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 we'll do more and more. More and more. Cool. Also because it's very successful. Um, oh, uh, there's another question that just popped up from Taylor. How long does it stay does it stay in barrel on the lees post fermentation? I assume she means the white, but maybe uh, you yeah, can speak about white, all the wines uh, for the, so for the, the elevage. It's new oak, 100% new oak. Same toast as for the red. So very small flame, six hour flame on a very long barrel, cigar shape. That's really for the lees. Uh, we only do a six month aging in oak. Then we remove the wine into a concrete vat barrel, a uh, concrete vat, and we use the barrels for the red. Six months, largely enough. We don't want any toast, uh, just the refinement of a new oak that comes from the GP area on the, on the, on the wine, but that'll be it. Okay. Um, oh, and Daniel's wanting to know if the beaches in Arcachon are open yet. <laughs> yes. Yes? Yeah. No. No. You know the funny, I had to tell you a story about, uh, about Arcachon. <laughs> you know, before the COVID, uh, all the issues with what we're having now, the beach were closed for about three, week, three weeks before the lockdown. You know why? There was oh. a big boat that sunk with five tons of cocaine. <laughs> and all the cocaine with the waves came onto the beaches of, Arcage, of uh, the Cap Ferry. <laughs> and all the dealers from France were driving uh, into the southwest of France to try to take one of those big bags of cocaine. So they were locked before the COVID. This is so funny. <laughs> you, had, you had literally half of the army, half of the army of this country was based in, um, uh, in Arcachon and the Café because of the sinking of this boat. <laughs> there were millions of dollars of cocaine literally on the beaches floating on the beaches. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> so now we're back in business. We're allowed to have some cocaine on the beach and it's fine. Add some wine. <laughs> some Excellent. All right. All right, everybody. Um, are there, if, if there's, are there any more questions anybody has for, uh, for Philippe or should we, should we, should we wrap this up? It's, it's been about an hour and a half. No, <laughs> that's funny. I like Daniel's comment. All right, everybody. Um, I don't want to take too much of uh, anyone else's time and most especially Philippe's. It's very generous of you um, 
to, to join us. I know it's... Uh, yeah, what, a question what, from uh, Farouk huh? uh, asking of whether it's possible to visit any time, of course, of any of you. Oh, I didn't uh, see that. Yeah, yeah, oh, can we visit? Uh, oh. It's probably not a conversation. It may, may be private, but I, what I mean is that uh, any time, any time, for sure, any time. It's not like Bordeaux here. You're allowed to come over and drink and stay <laughs> And uh, sleepover better because we're going to have a lot of wine and a lot of food. So uh, I can I can vouch for that. Uh, that is true. And and you will probably, uh, except for maybe some old bottles of Chateau Vitae Fair, um, mostly what Philippe will be pulling out of his cellar is going to be great Burgundy and uh, and Barolo and 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 all sorts of other cool wines. So uh, and you will eat very very well. <laughs> Thank you, right, Philippe. Everybody. Thank you, Todd. You bet. Thanks, Daniel. Thanks for thanks everybody for joining us. Cool. All right, everybody. Bye, bye everyone. Passe le bonjour à Catherine de ma part. Salut, c'est ce que je voulais dire. Elle a des clés de trois enfants là. Non, on a les quatre. Donc là, les. Elle est tout mon état table. Il m'attend pour manger. Elle a, elle a pas pu venir, malheureusement. Très bien. Merci beaucoup. Thanks, Bob. Bon appétit. Bye, bye, all of you. Bye, Rachel. Hello, Rachel. <laughs> You're still muted, Rach. There we go. Oh, yeah, I'm still muted. <laughs> there we go. Thanks for the I have a noise in the background here, so. <laughs> yeah, Lily, Lily screeching. Yeah, do you got it. Do you have Lily there? Oh yeah, show show Philippe. Wow, beautiful baby. I saw the picture the other day. Beautiful, <laughs> beautiful. So I have I have a double magnum for you. All right, looking forward to it. Yes. Wait. It's only for you. You're Don't wearing your, your, own mine, Lily, your own bottle. Well, uh, <laughs> I'm so excited. I'll be happy. Give uh, hey, give give our best uh, to to we'll Kathleen. Do, yeah, please. We'll do. Um, me and uh, for sure, for sure, me and Dustin and maybe some uh, some others. We plan to get over there as soon as uh, we're allowed to come to France. Uh, so we will definitely come see you. We want to come visit visit everyone, and uh, we're probably not going to move for a long time now. What they what? We're 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 going to be staying here this summer, all summer. Yeah, yeah, but that's fine. We're happy. We're by the river. The pool is cool temperature, and uh, yeah, and all the families here. We weren't expecting to have all the kids with us, so uh, actually, it's 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 pretty. It's a blessed moment for us. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's serious. Nice to be able to spend time with the family. Yeah, it's great. It's great. Honestly, it's great. All right, buddy. I'm the barbecue guy, you know, so. Uh, exactly. <laughs> well, uh, well, as soon as we're allowed without having to be quarantined, we're, uh, we're going we're gonna to come visit, okay? Great cool. stuff. Great stuff. All right, guys. Thank All you. right, everybody. Au revoir. Au revoir. Bye-bye. Au revoir.